everyone. Thank you for joining us for AO Trauma North America's Orthopedic Trauma Journal Club series. Tonight, we will be discussing non-unions. I'm Paul Matazuski, and I'm here uh, with the uh, AO North America Trauma Journal Club, and I'm here with Dr. Janet Conway from the International Center for Limb Lengthening at the Rubin Institute for Advanced Orthopedics in Baltimore. Thanks for spending the time with us today, Janet. Thank you for the invitation, Paul. So we're here today to discuss the article that was published in the JBJS American volume in 2008, entitled Antibiotic Cement Coated Nails for the Treatment of Infected Non-Unions and Segmental Bone Defects. So we want, I wanted to start off the, the questions, uh, Dr. Conway, uh, just to get back some background as to what was the impetus for this, for this article? Why did you uh, perform this technique and start doing this technique and then and wanted to look back at, with this series? Sure. Um, well, uh, you know, um, initially, uh, you know, these patients are really difficult patients, the infected non-unions and the uh, segmental bone defects. And so, um, you know, in 2002, um, was like our first case when we did an antibiotic coated rod, a locked rod, you know, and we had used the mold method and, uh, it was a custom mold and we did it, um, for, uh, you know, a specific patient and it was a femoral rod and everything. And then we were able to wind up using that mold for multiple patients because you could sterilize it and, um, it wound up being a pretty nice way to create an antibiotic coated nail but it was like time consuming labor intensive and sometimes the coating was like just okay but it, it actually did a good job and like we used that for like our first um 20 patients and then uh you know um we were trying, always trying to figure out a better way to do it like the chest tube was a problem because it would melt to the um uh, cement if you didn't get it off fast enough and you can only do a certain diameter and so um sort of the next generation um was the silicone tubing method and so um we had good success with the first 20 but it you know it was a pain in the neck the, the the mold method and so um when we finally got that silicone tubing and we started using the tigon tubing with them and uh it was great because it didn't melt to the tubing the cement didn't melt to the silicone tubing you could make it on the back table and it was totally uniform and you had a little bit uh more control over the diameter and it didn't, you know, uh, chip off when you put it in and take it out. So, um, this, uh, paper was sort of our, uh, we compared the first 20, uh, with the mold method. And then we, um, then, uh, compared the next, uh, 29 or so with the, um, tubing method. And so we had some nice, uh, sort of comparisons because um, there was less complications with the tubing method and it was just easier, it took less time in the operating room. So uh, this was sort of our comparison paper and then sort of the transition to moving on to this better method for making the rod. Oh, that's wonderful. I guess the, the follow-up question to that is prior to doing these statically locked antibiotic coated rods, what were folks primarily doing? Um, you know, uh, we were doing a lot of uh, guide rod coated um, with uh, chest tubing, you know, uh, so it was like an antibiotic coated uh, cement on a guide rod. And so we would do that and then either put them in an X-Fix and wait to sterilize the canal or put them in a cast or make them non-weight bearing. And so um, patients, 73% of the patients didn't have to have another operation. So we went from non-stable guide rods coated with um, antibiotic cement to stable statically locked nails coated with cement and we never had to go back. So it was, it was, um, I don't know, really revolutionized my practice. Definitely, definitely a game changer. And, you know, <clears throat> you know, there was obviously a difference between the, the two, the two groups, the, the mold technique, as well as the, um, the silicon tubing technique and that was an interesting point for me were there any other surprising things that you found in your your results that you didn't expect um you know uh i don't think there was too many surprises as far as just you know the the coating was easier uh to put on it took less time and then it was nice to not have to worry like the complications from taking the rod out putting them in were a lot less just because there was no seam on the 
ride going in. You know, it was like put in, uh, it was sort of like pressurized when you were making the uh, rod. And so uh, the fact that it was uniform and it was really like, um, uh, you know, there wasn't any like kinks in the cement molding. You know, it was just really put on like the, you can only compress the mold so much, but that tubing and putting the rod in, you put the, the cement in first and then you put the rod in. So you like fill the tube up and then you put the rod in. So there's a lot of force between the rod and the, silicon tubing to really pressurize that cement. And I just feel like, you know, it was, uh, the, the complications really went down a lot with the uh, insertion and removals. And I thought that was great. And that was not a surprise, but it was a really awesome benefit from the second technique. And then um, when we first started doing this, when I first started doing this, um, it was such a little bit, like it was time consuming to mold. And so a lot of our initial patients we used were like, this is our last stitch effort before we amputate your leg. And then once we realized it actually worked and then we started getting the easier method, the silicone method, um, then we started using it in more patients because it was easier. So it's now been, geez, over 14 years since you started collecting data for this, this paper and being 2022, what, uh, what things do you think you've uh, learned since then? Do you think this technique is still, applicable today and and what things have you changed since the publication of this article sure well you know uh since we did the one from 2008 like we went on in 2014 and like published like a, a bigger series you know if you're comparing long bone non-unions and arthrodeses the long bone non-unions had a higher percentage of patients that didn't have to have additional surgery than the arthrodesis patients sometimes we're doing these big segmental defects in the knee region and so it was getting to be a little bit of a pain in the neck when the rod's not cannulated and so the uh guide rod uh long guide rod that we use to cannulate the knee arthrodesis nails has been really helpful for sort of shish kebabbing our uh, spacer across the level of the knee joint and um just makes it easier to insert takes less time you know i'm not like fiddling around with like a not cannulated rod so that's like um sort of the next level that we've been doing for some of these things. And then, you know, I still think the cement coated rods are an effective way to get antibiotic delivery and bony stability. But like, there's a lot of things um, moving forward that I think canals that are too tiny are hard to treat sometimes and you wind up not being able to coat a rod. And so sort of like the next evolution of things is calcium sulfate injections, you know, into the canals. And so we've been doing some of those things for cases where we really can't use an antibiotic coated rod. And so we'll use a smaller rod and inject the canal and put it in. And that's been pretty effective um, in cases where you can't coat a rod just because of the diameter of the rod plus the cement. So I think there's room for that moving forward. And the other thing that is sort of coming down the pike with these things are, you know, everyone has their own way to make the rod. And so there's a lot of people out there that do it their own way. Like Joe Shu has a really nice technique for, um, for fusion tubing that he uses. He's got a video out there on it. He just published in um, Journal of Orthopedic Trauma on that. He had like 30 cases uh, and that's been successful for him. And I use the silicone tubing. Some people still use the chest tube. And so there's a lot of variability out there of this technique because there's no standard rod that you can pull off the shelf from X company and put it in. And so I think that'll be also on the horizon is getting like a standard off the shelf rod. There's been some stuff in Europe, like there's been a couple of um, theories published by like Schmidmeyer on uh, genomycin coated off the shelf nails and um effectiveness and tibial non-unions and um, open tibia fractures. And they're showing some good results with that. Okay. Um, you know, the other thing that, that came up to me that I thought was interesting was that you use this method to treat a lot of folks with segmental defects as well. And you didn't really touch on that too much in the paper, but can you elaborate what your, your protocol was for those patients in the, in this, this series? typically where you place in the antibiotic coated rod with an additional spacer around it and then doing a induced membrane technique, or was it something entirely different? My favorite way to take care of these patients is transport over a nail, just cause I don't have to do too much work going back, you know, cut the bone, put the frame on, 
leave it on for X number of days, like, you know, two months, three months, come back, uh, put a little lock plate and some bone graft on and then take the X fix off. And so, uh, you know, that surgery, I could get him out of the hospital the next day. It was so quick putting the X fix on and doing an osteotomy and taking the spacer out. And then, you know, the next operation again would be about an hour going to surgery, putting a little lock plate on to hold the segment down, putting some bone graft in. And then, um, the only difference, you know, with the bone transport and the keeping the rod in is I wouldn't let them weight bear during the transport. And I wouldn't let them weight bear for at least six weeks following the, um, bone grafting, you know, so they had a little bit of time where they were, had to be off their feet, but, um, you know, that's how I manage some of those segmental defects. Mm -hmm. So for our um, listeners today, the, the last question that I have uh, for you is if there's any take home points and the one thing that you'd want someone to get from this article, if they read this, what would, what would that be? I think if you take the time to do a good job making the nail, you know, and make sure the cement's kind of gooey and liquidy, like depending on how you're going to, what, what method you want to use, um, you know, you don't want the rod too fat. Like this is where you're going to have problems. If the rod's too fat, if you don't do a good job making it, if you don't do a good job reaming your canal a couple millimeters over, like all these little technical pearls will keep you out of trouble. And so like if someone's like, oh my gosh, it's such a good idea. I want to try it. Like you need to make sure that like if you use two bags of cement, use a full extra monomer, uh, you know, because you really need it to be liquidy because if you dilate that tubing, too much however you're going to whatever method you want to use with the either perfusion tubing or the silicone tubing and the chest tube if you dilate it too much your rod diameter is going to be really fat and then you could get your nail incarcerated you know because you're not reaming like for that ginormous nail you're reaming for uh you know a smaller diameter and so i'm really careful about making it so that i'm not going to give myself trouble and so say i use like a 12 and a half millimeter inner diameter tubing, like a half inch tubing. Uh, I'll ream the tibia to 14. I'll ream the femur to 16 because there's a bow in the femur. And so sometimes that rod I'm putting in is, you know, just based on the, when I'm coating it with cement, sometimes the bow gets a little, you know, it's not as perfect because the silicone tubing is flexible. And so I overream the femur also too, because like, um, the tubing as you're making a bigger rod sometimes get more di gets more dilated and so i don't ever want to take a chance i have one rod i put in that was incarcerated and that was a bit of a drag and so i'm always careful with over reaming a couple millimeters so i ream like i said 14 in the tibia and then 16 in the um femur and i'll really be careful making the rod so i'm not having any problems and i think if you're going to do it they're the biggest take-home points be really careful making your rod for the diameter and definitely over ream. And then when you take it out, make sure you clean out the top of the sort of insertion area really well so that if you're taking the rod out, you're not pulling the rod out of the cement. You're going to pull the cement coating out with the rod. So I always make sure when I'm taking it out, I clean out and make sure I see that little cement rim around the rod before I start pulling it out just so I don't have to be like, oh man, the cement came off, you know? And so just being really careful with uh, inserting it, removing it and making it, I think keeps you out of trouble. And then starting to use it in simpler cases first uh, is always my rule of thumb. Like the chip shot wands, like a pretty standard non-segmental bone defect ankle fusion or like a standard, not big defect tibial non-union. And then as you get more and more comfortable with the technique, you can use it for harder cases, more difficult cases. And, um, you know, I think that's just in general, but there were take home points. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time with us today. And I can't wait to try the technique. Well, thanks for having me, Paul. I really appreciate it. And I hope everyone likes it. And Jay Conway at lifebridgehealth.org. If you have any questions, I'm always happy uh, for you to email me because um, I want everyone to successfully apply this. I think it's helped me and I'm looking forward for it to helping other people. So thanks again.